It's a joy to worship the Lord. And uh, today we would like to just invite each one of you out there to open your hearts as you listen to the melodious voice and the singing of our dear sister, La Plenga Kaur Sola.
Before we go on any further, I'd just like to make one request. That is that you have your Bibles with you and kindly turn to the references whenever I am um, quoting one or two. Number two, I would also request you to go through the chapters, read them yourselves, because we won't have time to read every verse, every passage of what we'll be covering today. And uh, with that all set, let's commit to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you are the everlasting, eternal word. And we pray that your word will come alive again to us as the word itself says. The entrance of your word gives us light. We pray that you will enlighten our hearts and even our understanding so that Lord, we may grow even deeper in our knowledge of you, our relationship with you, and in our walk with you. We pray that you bless this time with the meditation of your word. For we ask all these in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Continuing on the, on the theme of walking tall. Last week we saw from the life of Enoch and what it meant. The four practical lessons that we've learned from him. But this is the second part. And... Uh, I'll be talking about, or rather learning from three different people mentioned in the scriptures. The first one would be Abraham, then it'll be Joseph, and thirdly, Moses. But today's section we'll be dealing with Abraham, uh, just the first part of it. And we'll try to cover that in the next round. So, what we'll be doing here is we'll be reading from Genesis. I want you to read from Genesis 11, especially the end part, beginning, beginning with verse 27. Go right up to verse 10 of Genesis 25. That is what we'll be covering for these two Sundays. Now, just as a matter of introduction, I've mentioned that we'll be talking about Abraham, Joseph, and Moses. All these three men have the call of God. Abraham was called by God to journey to the promised land. Joseph was called to be a deliverer who went through life's ordeals. And Moses was called from the palace to identify with the oppressed people. As an overview, I'd just like to share something more about on, the, on, this, on this thought. All these men had one thing in common. They walked tall in their calling. But each one of them responded in a very personal way and the way they understood it understood the call of God but their response was that they walked in confidence and trust now that does not mean that they they had no uncertainty they didn't feel they didn't meet doubts and they didn't face fears but the end result proved them to be true, that they were true to the calling in spite of the human limita limitations and flaws. We'll be studying or looking at uh, Abraham this uh, today. What will be the first section? I'll be dealing with the second section later. Uh, let's begin by reading Genesis chapter 11 starting from verse 27. Then Terah became the father of Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. While his father Terah was still alive, 
Haran died in Ur of the Chaldeans, in the land of his birth. Abraham and Nehor both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nehor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Niska. Now Sarai was barren, she had no children. Terah took his son Abram, his grandson Lot, son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, the wife of his son Abram, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to Canaan. But when they came to Canaan, to Haran, they settled there. Terah lived 205 years, and he died in Haran. The Lord said to Abram, this is chapter 12, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I'll make you great into a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham left as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was twenty, was seventy-five years old when he set out from here. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions that they had accumulated and the people had acquired in Herod. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Okay, the starting point was with Terah. Terah purposed in his heart to take his family to this, to the land of Canaan. But upon reaching Haran, as we've read, he settled there instead, lived there and died there. Now what prompted him to leave and why he never reached Canaan is not mentioned in the scriptures. But the scriptures lay some very clear things here. And that was about Abram. Abram. Abraham in chapter 12 received a call. When he heard God call, and he said, Leave, let's read that scripture again in chapter 12. The Lord said, The Lord had said to Abraham, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation, I'll bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Verse 4, so Abram left as the Lord had told him and not one went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now Abram left because he received that call. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8, it mentioned that he, when Abram was called, he left not knowing where he went. That's very interesting. Now, the life story of Abram is found in the next 13 chapters up to chapter 24. Uh, An early portion of Genesis 25 it's just a record of his death, especially verse 10. But there are a few lessons that we can learn from this section of our study today. Let me repeat, we're looking at chapter 12 right up to chapter 18. Now, in, let's start with chapter 12. What we see there is that Abram believed God and because he believed God he took his steps of faith now when we say faith let me remind you it, that doesn't mean 
that there's no fear and there's no doubt in his heart. But this chapter records the aspect of Abraham's life responding to the call of God. But as he traveled through Egypt, he was afraid because Sarah, afraid of the Egyptians because of his wife's beauty. Sarah was a beautiful woman. And so he pretended to be a brother and he hid his identity of a husband. You know, he almost invited a disastrous end. But because of God's goodness and mercies, he was saved. Somehow, God did something in the land of Egypt. Because at that point of time, Pharaoh came to know about this beautiful woman who happened to travel to his country. So, using his royal power, he brought Sarai to himself to be his wife, supposedly. But God protected him. He didn't allow him to touch her in a sense, but he caused some trouble in the land. Later on, Pharaoh realized that Sarah was a married woman. And so, because of God's goodness and mercy, like he said, Pharaoh realized his mistake and he returned Sarai to Abraham. And also, he, he, was, he, he had a, a good sense in his heart, so to say, and he asked for prayer that God would spare the land from any disaster. Now, so the journey goes on. But it's very interesting as we see something else about Abraham here in chapter 12. Because as he traveled, he left by faith, he walked the walk of faith. And I just want to show you verse 8. It says, From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, and pitches then with, Beth with Bethel on the west, and Ai on, e on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and called on the name of the Lord. So, he walked by faith. He took the step of faith. And though he had some of these little mistakes, if you will, he had a heart of worship. Now, the moment we say worship, I know that we have our, we, we picture something in our minds. But let me just remind, uh, remind you that at that point, there's no format or form or organized worship yet. But the scripture says he built an altar. He was a worshiper. Now, looking at chapter 13, there are three important things or we, lessons that we can learn from him. In chapter 13, he was journeying from Egypt to the Negev. And uh, he again went through Bethel and he reached that place where he built an altar before. And again, he continued to uh, to build an altar there because it says he again called on the name of the Lord. And as they journeyed in chapter 13, one significant thing that happened was that he, he was blessed, so, Lot, uh, so was Lot, and so their, their cattle and herds increased to such a point that the land could no longer hold them together as you would read the scripture. So because of, 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 of that growth, and as there's a tension between, there's a strife between the servants of Lot and the servants of Abraham. And we know the story how they, you know, they, were, they began to quarrel, but here is another thing that we see concerning Abraham. Let's read from verse eight. 8 to 30. 
after hearing that there's this strife between the servants verse 8 says so Abram said to so Abram said to Lot let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine for we are brothers it's not the whole land before you let's part company if you go to the left I'll go to the if you go to the left I'll go to the right and if you go to the right I'll go to the left Lot Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, watered like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards over. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tent near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Now, one other quality that we see here with Abram, with Abram was that he gave Lot the right of preference. He was the one who was called by God. But yet, at this point of time, he let Lot make a choice. And Lot chose what his eyes saw to be more profitable and potential to make him wealthier. So he went to settle the plains of Jordan. Now, here is a lesson we learn. That Abram, this is a key thing. Abram has his priorities set in order. And what we learn here is that God's call is more important to him than God's blessings. He let Lord make the choice first. Whatever is left, then that will be his. But of course, God had greater blessings in store for him. When you read on with the story, you know, you, you'll find that out. But that's what we see. God, God's call upon his life comes before God's blessings. And a thought also I'd like to add here is that giving others the first preference does not necessarily mean settling for the second best. Apparently, Lot's choice was not the best for him, as we can see what happened later on. And the chapter ended with a mention of Abram, Abram building an altar. So what we see here is that he continued to be a worshiper. He continued to be a worshiper. His heart of worship was still there. Now chapter 14 is an interesting chapter indeed. Here is recorded about the battle or the war between the five kings against the four kings. And how these four kings subdued the five kings. And one of those kings, subdued kings was so was the king of Sodom, where Lot lived. So Lot was taken captive by the victorious king. But upon hearing that, Abram mustered the best of his men, fighting men, and went to war against the kings. And he was able to rescue Lot and all his goods. Now this is another quality that we see with Abram before we go on. Here is a, another quality. At one point of time, the, their servants were quarreling because of, because, of, of the, because of the land. And they had to part company. They had to part ways. But now that they have parted ways, Lot was in trouble. And you know what happened? What we see here that the moment he heard, he mustered the best of his men. It shows another quality of Abram, of Abram. And that is that his love and his and relationship with Lot did not die off. He still had that relationship with his own nephew Lot. And so 
he went to rescue him. And upon returning, he met this high priest or the priest of the Most High God by the name Melchizedek who served him bread and wine. And as this Melchizedek, the high priest of God, blessed him, Abram gave the tenth to him from all that he got back uh, from that battle. Again, a heart of worship. And the king of Sodom came to meet Abram. And as a token of gratitude, the king sort of made a deal with Abram. He said, with Abram, he said, okay, all the goods that you have been able to rescue, leave them with you, but just give me back my people. But you know, interesting, we see another quality of life in Abraham here. It's turned me as we read chapter 14 now. Beginning with, the, uh, start with verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abraham, to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and I've taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a threat or a thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Anar, Eshkol, and Mamre. Here's another quality of Abram. He was a man, you know, with convictions. And this conviction is, is, is very strong. And what was that conviction? He didn't want to be remembered as a man who gained wealth from other people's ordeals. That's why he said, I don't want you to say that I have made Abram rich. He don't want to be remembered as a man who gained wealth from people's problems. But he wanted to be remembered as one who served God by serving others. Now, let's go on to chapter 15, 16, 17, and 18. In these four chapters, we see Abram from another perspective. We see him as a human being with flaws and limitations. But at the same time, we see here in these chapters, the faithfulness of God who called Abram. God is always faithful to those whom he called. We know Abram followed the call of God and walked the walk of faith. He was walking tall. Now, but he had a problem. That problem was his childlessness. Well, at this point, God came to visit him to reaffirm the promise that he will have a child. But because of his childless, uh, childlessness, Abram reasoned from a human point of view. Let's read with me now this chapter 15. Beginning with verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless, and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? He reasoned it from a human point of view. He was concerned lest this servant of his would inherit all his possessions. But let's read on. And Abram said, You have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. But see what God, see how God responded. 
Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. At this point, God showed Abram his promise. By, turn, by letting him look at the sky, as numerous as the stars will be his descendants. Interesting verse 6 says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. This was the response of Abram and this has become a fund, one of the fundamental, fundamental theme in the New Testament teachings on faith. He believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Yet after all these reconfirmation and reaffirmation of the promises, we come to chapter 16, we still read about the human flaws and the limitations of Abraham and his, Abram and his wife Sarai. Keep in mind, God has spoken to him that an uh, heir will come from his body, not the servant. He will not inherit. He will not be the heir to his estate. He will not inherit the possession, the promises of God. But as an heir from his body. But as Ab Abram and Sarai humanly discuss about the challenge that they have. And that challenges their childish, childlessness. They both agreed that they would let Abram take his servant, her, her servant, Egyptian servant, Hagar, to bear a child or to, to become a, uh, an agent for, so to say, for childbearing. He and his wife agreed. They made a deal that Hagar would become his concubine, if you will, who will give, who will be able to give a child to the family. Now, that was a human attempt to solve a problem. God already promised out of his body. But at this point of time, that's what happened between Abram and Sarai. And so they thought they have solved, they, they've solved the problem. But this solution was very short, it was short term. Because the moment Hagar realized that she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. You read that in the story, in this chapter. So there was tension now between Sarai and Hagar. Because Hagar despised her mistress. Sarah, Sarai felt betrayed. And so she dealt hard harshly with Hagar who had to flee from the house but interestingly on the way she met an angel or rather the angel appeared to Hagar and then asking her or instructing her to go back or to return to Sarai of course God also promised some things to Hagar that she will have her share of blessings now, interestingly, as we proceed on with this, as we read on the story, there's a worst case scenario. When you come to chapter 16, Abram was now 86 years old when Ishmael was born. That's what it says there. And uh, it was only 13, let me see, it was 13 years later, so to say, God reappeared to Abraham, who is now 99. And he reconfirmed his promise by asking Abraham to walk before him. Let's read me now Genesis chapter 17. 
when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Now, chapter 17 says something about, uh, there are certain things we learn. In fact, there are three things we can learn from chapter 17. He was called because it says, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. Let's look at these two words here. Walk before me and be blameless. It's very interesting to look at, the, at this, what this word walk before me implies. It's, a, it's like two friends walking together on a road, on the road. And as friends, when you walk, you don't just look at the direction that you're heading to. As friends, you always turn to each other from time to time. Maybe a wink, a smile or something. And that is the, that is the idea that God says, walk before me. He wanted him to walk like a friend. Of course, therefore, we, we read in the New Testament, James said he was called the friend of God. Abram was called the friend of God. So he walked with God as a friend. And then this word, and be blameless. This word blameless in the Hebrew, Hebrew dictionary, it, it connotes the idea of integrity or a life of integrity. Now, integrity does not mean that you're perfect and flawless, as you can see that from the life of Abraham itself. It's being morally conscious and truthful. That's what God required of Abraham. That Abraham would walk with these virtues. If he's going to see the realization of God's promises, especially of the Son, and he must walk blameless before God. Now, in this chapter, we also read something that happened to Abram and Sarah. God changed their names from Abram, who's just a high father, to Abraham, who was a father of multitude. From Sarai, a sort of a princess, to Sarah, which is a queen. Now, after this divine, div, divine visitation, after this divine visitation, Abraham circumcised himself, 99 years old, and also Ishmael, who was 13 years old. And he circumcised all the men of the house. Now, circumcision is a mark of trust, of covenant, that he had made with God. But let's come to chapter 18, the last section of our study to, for, the, for today. In chapter 18, God revisited Abraham in the form of three human beings who came to his tent. Actually, they were angels. And they came with a message two messages in fact the first message was that one year from that point of time of their visit Sarah Sarah will bear a son somehow Sarah was standing behind the door of the tent eavesdropping to what Abram and these three men were talking about eavesdropping to their conversation she laughed when she heard that word that she will bear a child. Now, I think she, we may be wondering, why was she laughing? Because if you, want, if you remember, she was already past child-bearing age. So humanly speaking, it's impossible for her. It's no longer possible for her. But she forgot the divine point. She forgot the divine promise. The second message that these people brought to Abraham was that God 
was about to judge the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sin and immorality of the cities have gone up to God as an outcry. The sin there was a sin of rebellion against God and anything that is godly, anything that is right. Now chapter 19 gives us the detail of, of how human dignity has reached its lowest ebb and immorality was so blatantly rampant. This is where we see Lot's choice of the place was not a good decision in the first place. Perhaps he did not consult or pray to God nor waited for his guidance when he chose Jordan, the plains of Jordan. But even in chapter 18, we again see the heart of Abraham. He had compassion for the people of the two cities and pleaded with God. What if there were 50 righteous people in the cities? Would they be destroyed along with the wicked? God's response through these three men, or should I say three angels, was that he would have spared the city for the sake of the 50 righteous. Abram continued to plead for the two cities by counting backwards the numbers of the righteous. What if there are 45? What, what if there are 40 or 30 or 20 or 10? The response was clear. God would have spared or deferred his judgment upon these cities if at least there are 10 righteous people. And when you read the chapter, you see that it was only Lot, a man who followed Abram because of the call that Abram received, now was gone to settle elsewhere, and now this is Sodom, and that's Sodom. He, his wife, and his two daughters were, rest, were, were the people we're about to rescue. Even the two sons in law of Lot laughed at Lot when he told them about the impending judgment. They thought it was a joke. Something is mentioned in chapter 19 about Lot, um, Lot's wife, that after, after they were rescued and as they left the place, somehow. Lot, Lot's wife still have a heart for the cities because they've given out, these angels have given a warning that they should not look back at all. They should not turn back just to even watch it. They just have to leave and leave quickly. But you know the story? Lot's wife somehow had something about those cities. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Now, here we have traveled with Abram and so we have some challenges that we learn from him. Let me leave you with these four challenges and hopefully we'll be able to assimilate and apply them in, into our life. Number one, we cannot walk tall, we cannot walk tall until we have come to terms with the call of God. It's a serious call. As Christians, we used to, think, we used to uh, share our testimonies about having received Christ. What does that mean? We always say we have received Christ in our hearts, but what does that mean? If we have received Christ, it means we have been given a call. Remember, Jesus came to call. He called people to follow him. So we cannot walk the walk of faith until we have realized the importance, the significance of the call upon our lives. My friends, receiving Jesus does not mean just a free ticket to heaven. When we receive Christ, it means we receive the call. The call to walk tall. I hope and pray that you will be examining yourself concerning the time when you give your life and your heart to Jesus. Because to walk with God means 
to walk or to take the steps of faith. And taking the steps of faith means obeying even when we do not see the full picture, just like Abraham. But to trust him in his sovereign power and his wisdom. The second challenge, walking tall means being true in or with your worship. I think our minds have been so conditioned to think about worship only in rituals and the way we do things in church. But it's time to re-examine ourselves. How do I express my life of a worshiper? A true worship is when we have acknowledged and allowed God to be in full control of our lives. Now remember, Walking tall, walking in faith is a journey in spite of fears, doubts and mistakes. We're not, we are not uh, free from temptations and fears. We are not failure proof, that's what I mean to say. When we walk by faith, we still feel, we still, we still meet the doubts and the fears and the challenges. Thirdly, walking tall is to let go and let God. That's what Abram taught us. He did not let the blessings of God to hold him back. I remember the time when he had to settle things with Lot his very nephew. He let go of what he what could have been his, but he clung on to the promises and that relationship that he had with God. Let others have the temporal benefits, but let's ascertain that we have this lasting one, that true living relationship with God. Lastly, number four, working with God does not absolve us from our duty to our fellow men in their times of needs and crisis. Some people, they're, they're, they're too spiritual, too holy, that they, do, that they fear to come into contact with, with fellow human beings. Somebody said, to be earthly, heavenly minded, they're too earth, heavenly minded, but no earthly good. My friends, walking tall means having a heart of compassion and concern for others' welfare. Abraham did not forget Lot, though he, they are parted ways. Abraham was ready to rescue Lot when he was in trouble. Walking tall means having a heart of compassion and a concern for the welfare of others. Let me close by saying this. Walking tall is about God and about others. It is seeing our own limitations and flaws, but still helping others. May the Lord bless us and may we grow to live responding to the call to walk tall with Jesus. If any one of you have not made that decision, I challenge you today because Outside the call, life has no meaning. God bless you.